Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inshallah, we'll go on to now in part two of photosynthesis. Part two is light independent reactions. In other words, reactions that do not require light um, as, uh, uh, um, uh, as part of their uh, storyline, so to speak. There's no light involved. Sometimes they are uh, referred to as dark reactions probably not the best term to use because it suggests that they occur in the dark. Uh, contrary to that, as you know, they occur any time during the day. Uh, it's just that they do not need uh, light, so that's why they are so, so uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's probably best to use the term light-independent reactions. In this part of photosynthesis, the energy that was produced in part uh, one of, uh, of uh, Photos, uh, photosynthesis, which is described here, the energy that was produced uh, in the form of NADPH and ATP is converted into uh, sh uh, sugar energy or glucose. Over here are the light dependent reactions, um, and um, uh, that's the generation of a high energy electron when the photon strikes uh, chlorophyll and then, and then high energy electron being uh, transferred uh, uh, through a series of uh, membrane proteins in the thylakoid um, and uh, 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 transferred uh, to a series of proteins uh, in the membrane in the thylakoid uh, generating a, uh, a hydrogen ion gradient in the thylakoid lumen over here. And uh, and finally, and uh, this ener uh, high energy electron eventually being accepted by uh, NADPH uh, uh, in, and forming thus this high energy compound. As you also recall, uh, light energy strikes the uh, of, uh, uh, photosystems, uh, both uh, photosystem one and photosystem two, and uh, in this cascade of events. Um, also, please recall that uh, water is the uh, donor of electrons that go on to replace the uh, electrons that were lost over here. And that results in the production of oxygen, which diffuses out into the end of our element. And this hydrogen ion gradient, if you recall, also is then used to produce ATP using this uh, ATP synthase transmembrane uh, protein, which is a beautiful motor type of thing. So, and as you can also see, uh, this, um, uh, this play occurs in, in the chloroplast, which is the bean-shaped sh thing that is uh, a cartoon d d uh, drawn over here. And so the whole thing occurs in the chloroplast, and this represents a thylakoid uh, membrane over here. And uh, the high-energy compounds conveniently produced are, uh, are uh, in the stroma, uh, of the cyto uh, of the chloroplast. Okay, so this here represents the C H L O R O P L A chloroplast, and so th these conveniently uh, are in the stroma of the chloroplast, and they can go on and participate in the phase two of uh, the uh, photosynthesis. Okay, so phase two of photosynthesis, as we have stated before, uh, occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast. Okay. Now, what happens in this is basically the energy that's in these compounds is given to uh, uh, to molecules of the Calvin cycle. Okay, and uh, these molecules then produce uh, sugar. As you can see, ATP is donating its energy, NADPH is donating its energy, and again ATP. Once ATP donates its energy, it goes back to its low energy form, which is ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And that adenosine triphosphate gives to a, 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 a phosphate a high energy band, and it becomes adenosine diphosphate. When NADPH gives up its a high energy electron, it becomes NADPH plus H plus. And these low energy compounds, these low energy compounds, okay, then they are free, as you can see over here, these low energy compounds, then they are free to go participate right there again. Uh, to be energized and uh, come right back and, and, and do this thing. So it's a, it's a cycle uh, that continues uh, 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 like this. Now, I also like to bring to your attention here, my dear student, 
is um, is how CO2 is uh, participating in the second part of uh, of this reaction. Now, CO2 is the only ingredient other than the NADPH and ATP to run this cycle. In other words, if you were to run a citric, uh, if you were to uh, run a Calvin cycle, and if you wanted to make a list of ingredients, you would of course need NADPH. You would need ATP, and the third thing that you would need definitely is the CO2. Okay, everything else is already over here in a cycle form. Okay. So this is the overview. Now, why is this called the Calvin cycle, the second part? Okay. Um, before I talk about that, I just want to bring to your attention also, there's no light involved in here. That's why it's called light independent or uh, dark reactions. Okay. So now, why is this called a Calvin cycle? A cycle is a series of chemical reactions uh, that uh, result in the production of the original compound. In other words, a cycle is a series of chemical reactions like this, okay, and then which regenerate the original compound. So A gives to B, B gives B gives C, C gives D, D gives A, and get back to A. So that's why it's called a cycle. As you can see in in this uh, 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 cycle, uh, RUBP, okay, okay. Uh, this compound gives 3PGA, whatever that is, and that 3PGA gives uh, G3P, uh, which is famous, and uh, and G3P it gives right back this. So this, this is why it's called a cycle. Now, in this cycle, the only thing that's being reintroduced, so all of these compounds in the cycle are... Um, uh, are um, are, are, are going to be just going round and round and round. The only thing that's new over here is the fact that there's a CO2 uh, that's being introduced. So this is the only new compound that enters in every cycle, everything else being constant, okay? Now, why is there cycles like this? And this is not the only cycle that occurs uh, in nature, but you must recall, this cycle is like over oh, 3 billion years old, and, and is, uh, it, it's, it's like... Uh, uh, assembly line process. It's much more efficient to do processes like this uh, uh, in, uh, in cells um, uh, than to create glucose, let's say, from six CO2s. But whatever it is, uh, it's, a, it's much more efficient it's, and it's a remarkably beautiful process. I, I warn you also that this is a little bit tricky, but uh, this is al uh, almost the heart uh, of photosynthesis in a way, okay? along with the electron transport chain over here. And if you understand this part, and if you take the effort to understand this part, uh, I, I think you'll appreciate it, uh, the whole process much more. So I request you to uh, uh, take time here um, and not try to rush, rush to this process here. It will be worth the effort, I believe, okay? So, so the second part of photosynthesis is called the Calvin cycle. And in the Calvin cycle, the only new compound that's introduced is CO2, along with the high energy uh, molecules that will be converted into sugar. That's the goal of Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle has two goals in a way. First, to produce the sugar, and second is to regenerate uh, the uh, compounds, right? So it has two goals. First is to produce the sugar, and second is to regenerate the compounds so the cycle can keep going and on and on. Now, so the Calvin cycle takes ATP and NADPH plus H plus. This is another way of basically writing NADPH. Uh, it, it takes ATP and NADPH and and uh, and converts it into glucose. So glucose is the uh, stored form of ATP. It's like if ATP were cash. Glucose would be m the money that's stored in the cache. It's a stored form of ATP. Plants need to store energy because like, in winter times, there's no leaves around. So they need to uh, rely on their stored resources to survive the winter. Um, plants, uh, that's one reason. Of course, in, in the spring, they need to have the extra energy uh, to, uh, for, for, uh, for the buds to form uh, and the flowers to bloom, etc. So uh, plants store energy in the form of glucose, okay? And um, 
uh, restore glucose too in our bodies, right? Uh, restore energy in the form of glucose, and liver is a place where we find lots of glucose uh, because uh, we uh, sometimes when we're doing things, we we use up glucose really fast, and we need to rely on the stored form of energy, glucose, uh, that we have, okay? But uh, anyway, so it, uh, glucose is a stored form of energy that we have, okay? Now, the Kelvin cycle looks like this. Um, it is, um, is, it looks more complicated than it is. And um, I don't wish you to be intimidated by this because we are going to go through it. Uh, in fact, I wish in the end for you to appreciate the beauty that's uh, uh, behind this process. And um, um, it's it's a little tricky. And the tricky part, the tricky part I'm, I'm going to suggest to you right now is going to be over here. And but if this part you understand this part, then you understand uh, a, a whole photosynthesis process. And uh, so hang tight, and uh, don't forget to enjoy the ride, inshallah. Okay, so we're going to talk about Campbell's cycle here uh, uh, slowly. Now, as if you recall, if you recall, there are two goals of the Kelvin cycle. Um, one goal is, of course, to produce glucose, which is over here. Okay. The second goal is to make sure the cycle keeps running like this, right? So the second goal is to produce the starting molecule, which is over here, okay? So it's going to start over here and come over here, and the cycle is going to continue around. So those are the two goals of, of the Kelvin cycle, okay? So we're going to start slow and take it slow. So the Kelvin cycle starts over here, where ambient carbon dioxide, which is a, a, a carbon dioxide surrounding the, surrounding the plant in the air, it just diffuses in. The carbon dioxide, like oxygen, does not need anybody's permission to enter the cell. This is a small molecule. It just diffuses in. So it enters this uh, uh, cell and then goes into the, into the chloroplast stroma. So carbon dioxide is readily available. Okay, it's like you're free of charge, really. Yeah, and uh, it's going to combine with the first uh, molecule of the Calvin cycle. Okay? First molecule of the Calvin cycle. Now, um, this molecule is of great interest to us because this molecule needs to be regenerated in the cycle. This molecule is called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Now, this is a 5-carbon molecule in other words, there are five carbons here. Carbons here are represented by black. So there's one, two, uh, there's three, and that's four, and that's five. So this is a five carbon uh, uh, atom uh, molecule. So it has five carbons here. Are you with me? So there are five carbons uh, in this uh, molecule. Okay? So right below is one five is positive. So the one five means it has a phosphate group here at the first carbon and it has a phosphate group here which is a red thing going thing here at the fifth carbon so that's that's what the name means and when you study chemistry you realize that there is a very specific methodical way of naming compounds so there, there are rules actually and regulations uh, for systematically naming compounds and the carbons are numbered so one two three four five so this means in this five a carbon compound. There are two phosphate group, one at one carbon number one and a carbon number five. Bis means two. So ribulose one five bisphosphate is a five carbon compound with phosphate attached to each end. So that's your brief introduction to ribulose one five bisphosphate, which is very important, as I said, and needs to be regenerated at the end of the cycle. Okay. So ribulose one five bisphosphate is going to combine here with carbon dioxide. So if you take a 5-carbon compound and introduce a, a, a carbon dioxide to it when they react, they should give you a 6-carbon compound intuitively, correct? Absolutely. They should give you a 6-carbon compound, but the 6-carbon compound that's formed is unstable, so it's actually going to give you two compounds, which are three carbon atoms each. So it's going to give you uh, uh, two small compounds uh, that are three carbon atoms each, so a total of six carbons. So what happens then again is when CO2 is formed and uh, it's going to form these two 
uh, 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 molecules. It forms two molecules of phosphoglyceric acid. Phosphoglyceric acid. Now, phosphoglyceric acid is, if you see here again, one, two, three carbons there and three carbons there. Okay? And it has the one phosphate here, one phosphate here, just like before. It's only a deduction of a new carbon atom. So we have taken a uh, so we have taken a five carbon atom molecule and introduced one carbon atom and we have produced two molecules that are identical that are three carbon atoms um, each okay now remember the purpose of the Calvin cycle is to store the energy that was produced in, in part one of photosynthesis, S to store the energy of, of that's ATP and, uh, and NADPH. So these molecules are going to basically, uh, are going to be the receptors, are they going to receive the energy or the high energy bonds that's in those two molecules. So what then happens then is the two uh, uh, phosphoglyceric acid, each one of them, is going to take uh, ATP molecules, and the ATP is going to give its high energy phosphate to this. So there's there's one phosphate here, right? Now it's going to have two phosphate. One is for the ATP. So there's going to be two of these reactions, two ATPs, then one for each over here. So that's what the Calvin cycle is for. It has molecules that are going to accept the high energy uh, bonds from these two, and they're going to the store. So the energy that used to be in the ATP is now in these molecules. Now when you attach another uh, phosphate, this becomes 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 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 So now you have produced these two molecules. Now again, the purpose of Calvin cycle is to store the energy as in high energy compounds. So it's no surprise then that the second step here here is going to be NADPH plus H plus which gives its energy to these uh, to, to these compounds to produce these two molecules. Now this glyceraldehyde three phosphate, okay, also just uh, sometimes simplistically written as glyceraldehyde three P, okay, is famous as I said. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate is a unique compound and uh, 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 very versatile. And ingeniously, it can play two different roles. Okay, it's like somebody who can be a like you know uh, uh, a, 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 a detective and a I don't know detective and a police officer at the same time or something like that. Uh, so it can play two different roles. It can do two things. Okay, uh, like these this molecule for example can do this. Okay, uh, but glyceraldehyde three phosphate and this is worth noting G. 3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, is a very unique molecule. It can do one of two things, okay? Now, the first thing it can do is one of the twins, okay, one of the twins. Now, these twins are so important that I kind of highlighted them by giving them like a blue halo to these uh, carbon compounds. See the blue halos? Okay, that's just to say this is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, okay? One of the things that these twins can do is one of the twins can transform itself into a slightly different compound, and this is called dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So one of the twins can transform into this compound, di di dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and then go right back to its twin, and they react together. So this one transforms into this, and they can go back right to its twin, and, and, the, and they react with each other, okay, to give you a six-carbon compound which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6. Now you understand this is a 6-carbon compound. Now what's the difference between fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, okay? What the difference is, is that this is a 5-carbon compound and this is a 6-carbon compound. 5-carbon compound and this is a 6-carbon compound. But the difference also is that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate has boatloads more energy than does ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate because during this uh, process of conversion of this molecule to this molecule, you have all of this energy that was required. So where does this energy go? It just doesn't dis did not just dissipate. It's contained in the bonds of this molecule. Do you understand? So the difference between ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is that 
fructose 1,6-bisphosphate has energy in stored in the bonds that it got that, uh, from, uh, from ATP and NADPH that, that, that donated their energy. So this is a energy-rich compound. You follow? Okay, fair enough. Now, think about this for a second. Okay, this process of taking one molecule and converting into another molecule, okay, uh, a second molecule which has lots of energy, required one carbon. So, in other words, you're taking carbon dioxide, which is participating in, in a series of reactions to produce a high energy molecule. You follow? The, so far, this high energy molecule does not look like glucose. That's cool, I'm with that, I understand that. But carbon dioxide is being used to facilitate, to help create a different molecule that has high energy in it. Okay. So, now, what I'd like to do is watch this, okay? Um, in first, not to be overwhelmed with this process, okay? Just, let's just review. Okay, let's take a nice deep breath. <sighs> don't worry. After a while, these names, they don't sound so threatening. They, they sound like, oh, old friends. No worries. Oh, ribulus 1,5 is phosphate again. I saw that in biology 1. Here it is in chemistry, in biochemistry, cellular biology, human physiology. You see that a lot. By the time you're done with education, hopefully, inshallah, these will be like old friends. Okay, here it is. So, skeleton cycle starts out with ribulose one 5 bisphosphate which is a 5-carbon molecule, and which reacts with carbon dioxide to give you two molecules that are three carbons each. These two molecules are now ready. This is phosphoglyceric acid. These two molecules are now ready to accept energy from ATP and NADPH. When they do that, the resultant product is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is very unique because it can do one of two things. One of the things that it can do is one of the twins can transform into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and then react with the other twin to give you fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The other thing that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate does is it can produce glucose. So it can produce glucose over here. So it can either produce fructose 1,6-bisphosphate these two twins, the twins can react to give you this, or the twins can react to give you that. You follow? So glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is very important for this reason, but think about this for a second, though. If the twins react to produce glucose, that's the end of the cycle. That's the end of the cycle. Right? But the, the idea is to produce... The, the, I, the, the, goal of citri the goal of the Calvin cycle, the goal of the Calvin cycle is to produce glucose and regenerate this ribulose one fibrous phosphate. How are you going to do that? Because as soon as you, these two glyceraldehyde two phosphate turn into glucose, I mean, that's it. They can't regenerate ribulose one fibrous phosphate, right? So that's how's it going to happen. And that is the beauty and that's the, uh, 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 the trick, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, amazing... Uh, 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 evolutionary uh, 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 process that this is has created. Now look, okay, you, uh, you'll understand how this both things happen. So this, this Calvin cycle is, is manages to do both, okay? It will produce fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and it will produce glucose, okay? Without uh, uh, abridging this process, without truncating uh, this cycle. Okay, but first let's understand the cycle. All right, so now we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, by a series of reactions, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to be converted into ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Now, as I have suggested in my introductory remarks, if this, if you understand this part from here to here, that, my friend, is the key to understanding the Calvin cycle. Okay, because what happens over here is a bit of a sleight of hand, like a little, you know, magic trick, so to speak. Like, you know, phew, something happens here, okay, that if you're not careful, you might, you might miss. Okay, so let's see exactly what happens. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is a 6-carbon compound, is converted, okay, 
is converted to fructose 6-phosphate. One of the phosphate is released. So now this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 6 carbon compound. Okay. Then fructose 6-phosphate okay, is then converted to another, another compound called ribulose 5-phosphate. Okay. And the ribulose 5-phosphate is then converted into, with the help of another ATP, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. But wait, something happened here. Something happened. So this is a 6-carbon compound, and it's converted to another 6-carbon compound. The only difference here is that there's a phosphate group that's missing. That's cool. No problem. But this is a 6-carbon compound. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6-carbon six compound. But then look, ribulose 5-phosphate is a 5-carbon compound. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five. So this is a five. So we had a six carbon compound, six carbon compound, five carbon compound. How did a six carbon compound become a five carbon compound? Mind you, there's no CO two leaving in this reaction like this. The CO two is not. It's not going away. Okay. So where where did this carbon go? Okay. So where did this the carbon go? Okay. That is the tree. Uh, that is the key question, and that is what you must attempt to understand and that is what I should attempt to explain so if you understand what happens to that carbon then you understand photosynthesis okay now I'm going to try to explain what happens to that carbon okay now I, I like to emphasize again that the only new ingredient here besides the ATP and NADPs is the carbon so notice that every time the cycle goes through one carbon is introduced and somehow it kind of just like goes away okay it doesn't go away okay it doesn't go away what happens is actually this series of reactions that are simplistically written over here they actually don't occur like this okay but now you must understand in the stroma of the chloroplast this cycle is going on like millions of times Millions, of, and they're not. And these molecules are not like sitting on their on a round table and going, "Okay, I'm going to give you that." It's not like that. Okay, it's like a soup in there, and they're all just doing things based on the concentration of what. Okay, what are we going? We're going to do this because it seems like there's more of this now, etc. So this reaction is going on lots of times. So any any given time, there are like millions of glyceraldehyde three pho uh, phosphate of, uh, there. And there are like millions of these, millions of these, you know, there are like a whole bunch of these reactions going on different stages in the stroma. That's one thing to realize, okay? So they're not restricted to go, do, they're not restricted in doing this. They can go on and do a thing. So this cycle, as is represented here, is a simplistic representation of what actually goes on in the Calvin cycle. But it's an accurate representation in, 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 uh, in the sense that you take fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, okay, and then you generate ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. In a sense, it is accurate representation in general that you take glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and you generate ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate. Okay, so you could truncate the, uh, uh, this uh, Calvin cycle by saying, okay, this is what happens. In fact, it is a more, uh, a more simplistic versions of the diagram. That's exactly what you see. Okay, in some basic textbooks, you skip all of this and just you put glyceraldehyde three phosphate goes to ribulose one five bisphosphate. Okay. So what really happens is more complicated. But what the thing that we must understand is what happens is you take glyceraldehyde three phosphate and uh, the, the the these two of these the heroes of the story, and you convert them. So how does that happen? Okay. Now, to understand this, look, we must uh, uh, examine six pretend six different Calvin cycles occurring in the stroma. Okay. Now remember, we are trying to do two things over here. We are trying to generate ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate over here, right, from, from G3P over here. And we're also trying to do glucose. Because if, you just, if these two guys just make the glucose, the cycle stops, right? So what we're trying to do is not stop the cycle. We're trying to regenerate the, the precursor molecules, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, 
and we're trying to re, uh, we're trying to uh, generate a glucose molecule, right? Which is which is the key. We're trying to generate glucose and we're trying to regenerate the original molecules. To understand how that happens, okay, I'm going to take you to a hypothetical intellectual exercise, so to speak. Okay, so now observe, if you were sitting, if, if, you, if you were in the cytoplasm, and you had in front of your eyes these reactions occurring in six def different places in the stroma. Okay, six different places. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put a pause button there. So all of them are going to like freeze, stop, pause. Okay, then we're going to say, okay, all of those glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates just come right out of the reaction like this. Okay, so all the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate that you're going to be frozen right in front of your eyes like this. So from six different Calvin cycles that are running in the stroma of the chloroplast, we're going to just gather all of these glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Now, so why six, you say? Just hang tight. You'll get it. So we're going to take the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate from six cycles. Now, these glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, we tell them, okay, you know, hey guys, I'm going to give you a job. Okay? I took you guys from these six cycles, I paused them over there, and I'm going to give you a, a, a task. It seems like an impossible thing to do, but you're going to do it. Right? You're going to, you're going to between, 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 all, between all you all, you're going to make a glucose molecule, and you're going to regenerate that 1, 5, is 5, and you're going to regenerate six of those. You're going to have to make six of these, right? There's one, there's two, and there's three, and there's four, and there's five. So you're going to regenerate those six, right? So you're going to do that. Plus, I want you to make a glucose molecule. And they go, hmm, no problem. Done deal. Okay, that's what we do. So now they have their task cut off first. They're going to make six ribose 1,5-bisphosphate, uh, and they're going to make a glucose molecule. Okay? They're going to make six of them so the cycle continues, that none of those cycles stop. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. So those are the six cycles. I put them right over there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? And I have also taken out all of the pairs of ribulose, uh, uh, glyceride uh, uh, 3 phosphate, G3P. So this is the first pair. That's the second pair. That's the third pair. That's the fourth pair. That's the fifth pair. And this is the sixth pair, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. First pair, second pair, third pair, fourth pair, fifth pair. So they go, and then I say, okay, we have to make six of these. Okay, fine, six of this. Now you understand, each of these glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate has three carbons. So each of them generates two of them, right? And there are six carbons here, six carbons here, six carbons here, six carbons here, six carbons here. And there are six carbons here between the two. Okay? So, now, if you take the first five pair, okay, the first five pair with a total of, right, and they have six carbons each, so it's going to be a total of 30 carbons. So between the first five pair, there's 30 carbons over here, and the last pair has an additional six carbons. Okay? Now, this is a five carbon cap. Now, to help us understand what happens here, and the it's seemingly impossible task those, those little tiny molecules, glycerol, that three phosphate had in before them, we're going to simplify this molecule. We're going to look, just focus on the carbon molecules and kind of like strip off all the other mo uh, atoms from that molecule so it makes it easy for us to understand. Okay, so we're going to get rid of this oxygen uh, hydroxyl group and the phosphate. Just get rid of them all. Just bare bone carbon skeleton to see what happens to the carbon atoms. So, what's going to happen is that you what they, what you notice is for them to do their job, that is to produce six of those ribulose one five bisphosphate. They only need five of these pairs. We're going to have an extra pair of G three P. Why are we going to have an extra pair of G3P? You'll see. Now, if you strip away all of the atoms from these molecules, here they are. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So you take five pairs, okay, of six of them, five pairs of six of them, OK? 
okay? So they have five pairs, and they have six carbons each, okay? That give you 30 carbons, right? 30 carbons. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye that all of these just say, okay, guys, let's see, let's uh, hold hands, okay? Let's, let's make one big carbon compound. This doesn't happen. This is a theoretical exercise to help you understand. And if all of them decided to get together, they will make one big carbon molecule like this. And this carbon molecule, now we're not using one pair. This glycerol d 2 is extra, you'll see. We don't need it. It just stays over there. So they be decide between themselves, okay, hey guys, we have enough over here. You guys are extra, so just hang on on the sidelines. Okay, so oh, fine, no problem, we'll hang on the sidelines. Okay, okay you go be, be sweet. Okay, fine, we'll be here, look cute and sweet. Okay, so, so then the rest of these, hypothetically, if they were to join together, they would make one long carbon compound like this. And this carbon compound would be would have 30 carbons in them. One you can count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Because there are five pairs. Okay, each of them six car carbons. So that's 30 carbons. Now, if you can imagine, I'm, n I'm now going to highlight one, two, three, four, the fifth carbon. Every fifth carbon here, I'm going to highlight. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. I'm just going to, so that just to emphasize, just to emphasize. If you do that, okay, every fifth carbon here in this is emphasized, just so that you can understand. So this 30 well, carbon mo uh, molecule, this is the fifth carbon. Okay, then I'm going to cut them into pieces like this. Okay, then I'm going to cut this big into five, uh, into 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 uh, small small molecules. I'm going to make six of those small molecules. See, if I cut them like that, I'm going to make six molecules. One, two, one, two, three four, five, six. I have made six molecules that are five carbons each. Got it? Because I had 30 carbons, I made six of them. And in fact, that's what happens. Okay, you take five pairs, five pairs of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and you make six and you make six ribulose one five is phosphate. Okay, so you take five pairs of ribulose uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and you make six ribulose one five is phosphate. And in fact, you have an extra glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now, why do you have extra glyceraldehyde three phosphate? That's because every cycle we have introduced a new carbon there. And we have taken six cycles. So in other words, we have introduced in this process six new carbons every time we went through. So there are six new carbons over here. Okay? So when you, do, when you take six cycles, because as I said, this reaction occurs billions, millions of times, billions of times in the stroma of the chloroplast, you will have lots of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, not all of them need, need to be used to regenerate ribulose by phosphate. In fact, for every six cycles, okay, you will have an extra pair of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which can go on to do anything that his, that his sweetheart desires. Do you understand? So, when this cycle occurs six times, because a, carb, a new carbon being introduced, it produces an extra pair of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which the cell can use to do anything. So the other five uh, pairs, go, uh, the other five pairs, the other five pairs go on to make six uh, ribulose 1,5-bis phosphate. Okay? The other five pairs go on to make six ribulose 1,5-bis phosphate. And each of those can go on to re regenerate this Calvin cycle, leaving this, the, the cell to do anything that it wants with the extra glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And what does it do? And because glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is such a beautiful, unique molecule that it can do these, both of these things, the cell uses that to produce 
glucose. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, the two of them react to give you a glucose molecule like that. Therefore, for every six cycles, you produce one glucose. Okay? For every six cycles, you produce one glucose molecule. And it takes six cycles because you need to introduce six new carbon atoms in, uh, into the cycles to generate one glucose molecule which has six carbon. So these carbons didn't just come from anywhere. They came from thin air. Ha, ha, ha. So it's very important to know. If you understand that, okay, then you understand photosynthesis and the, and, and the beauty and the last place in this process. So this is Kelvin cycle. The Kelvin cycle, in summary, is where you take uh, the starting pro pro uh, product, which is a uh, starting uh, substrate, which is ribose one five phosphate, and introduce a carbon uh, to create molecules that are able to accept high energy compounds to produce glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And glyceraldehyde three phosphate is used to regenerate ribose one five phosphate through a cascade of reactions, which are simplified over here. Or and the glyceraldehyde three phosphate is used to produce uh, glucose, which is the stored form of energy. Okay, if you understand that, you understand photosynthesis, and I hope you do, because I believe it's quite beautiful. This is our final slide. Is in summary, photosynthesis therefore is a process where uh, plants take uh, uh, water and carbon dioxide with the help of light to produce oxygen and glucose. That is the broad summary of photosynthesis, which is divided into two parts, the light-dependent uh, reactions and the light-independent reactions. In the light-dependent reactions, the sunlight strikes the photosystems, creating high-energy uh, electrons, which go through a, a, a series of proteins in the membrane and uh, to produce high-energy compounds, NADPH and ATP. As a byproduct of the light reactions, we have oxygen. And these high energy compounds can be used by the cell to do its cellular processes, or they can be used to, st to store them uh, uh, in uh, store their energy in high energy compounds such as glucose. And they do that by participating in the Calvin cycle, which takes CO2 to regenerate its, uh, 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 its components of the cycle, and it takes that same CO2 to produce glucose. The byproducts of, of, of these reactions after they have given up their, uh, their high energy are NADP plus and ADP, which go right back over, over to the part of phase one of photosynthesis to be regenerated. And all of this occurs, as you know, in the chloroplast in the plant cell. I hope you appreciate it. And next time, inshallah, we'll go on with uh, a, a process that's related to photosynthesis, cellular respiration, how, or how, how uh, cells derive energy from the glucose that they have produced and stored. Until then, as-salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa rabbil alameen, as-salamu alaykum.